Hey guys, what is up? John here from Fly8MikeAlpha.com. Back in the airplane here today for our What is Inside of an Airplane slash Let's Destroy an Airplane video series here on YouTube as well as on Fly8MikeAlpha.com. Today, we want to know what is the difference between applying maximum braking and skidding the tires? How long does it take the airplane to stop versus how long does it take the airplane to stop if you apply brakes properly and just apply maximum braking but don't let the tires skid. So get on the brakes really hard. How many feet does it take the airplane to stop from about 60 miles per hour is our target speed today. And we'll see exactly what the difference is between skidding versus applying brakes properly here in our Piper Cherokee. All right, let's do a pass here. We're going to do that 60 miles per hour. We're going to come up and cut the power right when we hit the beginning of the center line, right before the 1,000 foot markers, right before the aiming points, from 60 miles per hour all the way to zero with maximum braking, just slamming on those brakes as hard as we can. All right, there's 40, 50, 55, 60, and power's out, and there we are. Ooh, boy, this airplane really wants to go sideways on us. Managed to keep it on center line, or well, it ended up back on center line. It kind of drifted there for a little bit. But uh, feels like we got two good flat spots on our tires. And uh, luckily, they haven't blown out yet. So let's go ahead and try that one more time, applying proper brakes, not jamming on the brakes so hard, and just applying maximum braking to try to get the best stopping force and see if it's any shorter. All right, take two. This time we're going to be applying lighter brakes. Still very heavy, but not locking up those tires. We're doing our best anyways to not skid those tires. Here comes 40 miles per hour. 45, 50, 55, and there's 60. We'll go ahead and chop that power. And there's our starting point right now. Maximum braking without skidding the tires. See how quickly we can get this thing stopped. And, well, not quite sure that that was any shorter than the first time, but let's go ahead, review the tapes. We've got the drone overhead to let us know how we're doing. We'll go ahead, back to the studio, and review those tapes. And there's 60, we'll go ahead and chop that power. And there's our starting point right now. Maximum braking without skidding the tires. See how quickly we can get this thing stopped. And, well, not quite sure that that was any shorter than the first time, but let's go ahead, Review the tapes. All right, so to wrap this up, skidding versus just applying maximum brakes and trying to kind of ride the brakes right at that maximum brake effort. Well, yes, it did take 20 feet longer to get the airplane stopped actually applying the brakes properly rather than skidding, but a few really key takeaways here. Very difficult to control the aircraft when both tires are locked up. Really wanted to turn sideways on me. The wind really had complete control of the airplane and really wanted to turn the airplane sideways. Probably going to cause a massive loss of directional control Best case, worst case, a uh, huge loss of directional control, possibly going off the runway and breaking some gear off in the whole process. Luckily, we were able to kind of control it with the rudder and a little bit of moving around, differential braking there, helped us keep the airplane under control. Not the easiest thing to do when you're skidding. The other thing here is, from a scientific perspective, well, let's see, 420 versus 400 feet, that's a 5% difference. And did we come in a little bit faster by a mile or two per hour? Were the winds a little bit different, more headwind, less headwind, whatever? Basically, it's pretty much the same as what we can conclude here, right? From a scientific perspective of how much error we might have involved here, I'm definitely willing to bet that this is really the same. So whether we're going to be locking up the brakes totally and losing directional control of the airplane or just applying maximum braking force, it really takes about the same distance to get stopped. Now, it should, from a scientific standpoint, take less distance to get stopped if we apply the brakes properly, but what this really underscores, what this highlights for us, is that, well, it's really difficult for me to be perfect in applying the brakes, managing in between that maximum effort and skidding, that really fine line. I mean, can you ride the perfect angle of attack right between stalled and flying? That's what the stall pilots do, right, when they're coming into land. They're flying that really fine line, and of course, it's really hard to manage that, and quite frankly, I'm not that good at applying the brakes just right to get the maximum effort out of there like a test pilot might be. So what does that tell us? Well, all those stopping distance charts you have in your POH that were under the best case scenarios of good dry pavement, good tires, and a really sharp pilot knowing just how to properly apply the brakes. And after me with thousands of hours of flight time hopping in here and yeah, not really applying the brakes properly, 
I think what we can say is we need to take those stopping distance charts in our POH and cushion them a little bit and not trust them perfectly. Obviously it's good data, but add 50%, maybe double them even. They're not that long, you know, it tells us we're gonna take 400 or 500 feet to get the airplane stopped. Let's go ahead and add a little bit of room for error there because how good are we really? I couldn't manage the brakes that well. It actually took me longer to get this thing stopped with pushing on the brakes right at what I thought was maximum effort versus just locking them up. Bottom line, don't lock up your brakes. You'll lose directional control. Really hard to get the airplane stopped, possibly blow tires, probably break off some landing gear or depart the runway as you lose directional control. And you're not really gonna stop yourself any faster than that. Best way to avoid locking up the brakes, think before you land how much brake pressure you need, right? If you're coming in somewhere short, make sure that you're following the POH procedure. Maybe you need to retract flaps, put more weight on the wheels to prevent them from skidding. Obviously an airplane with lots of lift on it is going to skid easier than an airplane that's being pushed down with more weight on the wheel. So getting rid of those flaps usually will help follow the POH or whatever it says. Also think about what kind of pavement is this? Is this good hard pavement? Is it a little bit loose? Is it gravelly? Is it kind of grass? Is it slippery? Is it wet grass, dry grass? Is it wet pavement? What's the friction coefficient gonna be and how much can I apply these brakes? Bottom line is I don't have a lot of practice applying maximum MF for brakes because we never do this. We never want to tear up an airplane like this. This airplane we want to tear up because we can, but this is a rare opportunity to go out with an airplane you actually want to destroy. I've never applied brakes that hard in my life in an airplane because, well, we want to baby our tires and our brakes and our airframe and be gentle on it. And we teach our students to do the same thing. So it's not something we're really prepared for applying that maximum effort braking. I'm not saying to go out there and practice it because it is pretty hard on the aircraft. Bottom line is what I'm saying, add more room for error to your stopping distance charts so you don't have to go out there and be ramming on the brakes so hard. Hopefully this video is somewhat educational and if you take away nothing else, it's that, look, none of us are perfect. I can't go out there and perform perfectly on these brakes. You probably can't either and you should add some room for error to those stopping distance charts in your POH, 50%, 100% doubling the distance for the 100% or adding 50%, that's all a good place to start. Talk to your CFI about what they think you should do, maybe more, maybe less, whatever it is, but add something, give yourself a large room for error. Most of our runways are plenty long. We don't have to be landing in 500 feet or 600 feet anyways. So go places where you have a lot of room for error. Get that right training from your CFI of how to stack the deck in your favor, using those aiming points, not landing right at the beginning of the runway and not landing halfway down it, landing where you have a little bit of runway behind you, but making sure you have plenty of room down in front of you to get the airplane stopped safely without having to ram on the brakes. Think about the conditions you're flying in. Think about what the runway conditions are like that you're gonna be stopping on so you don't lock up the tires and lose directional control. And once you've done all that, then check out the rest of the playlist of all these videos here on YouTube of us basically destroying this airplane and explaining to you guys what is inside it. All part of our what is inside of an airplane slash let's destroy an airplane YouTube video series here on YouTube with a lot, lot more videos on flyatmycalf.com as well that are not here on YouTube. So if you guys like these videos, check out the link below that will take you to flyatmycalf.com and show you more of these Cherokee videos as we peel the skins off the wings, look inside the engine, tear things apart and explain to you how all this stuff works. As always guys, if you cannot fly every day, flyatmycalf.com, we will see you all in the next one. And I don't know why we're even trying this. Yeah, so that's exactly, that was actually a lot less than 30 miles per hour. That's exactly how guys wind up taking out taxiway lights and runway lights and having propeller damage.